saved, delivered, transformed by the redemptive work of Calvary, but still caged, free from our sins, forgiven, delivered, transformed, but still caught. It's the conundrum of Christianity. It's the great contradiction. How can I be saved and still wrestle with my past? How can I be saved and still fight anger, despair, depression? How can my temper still rule me? How does suicide thoughts still enter my mind? If I'm saved, how is it then that I am bound? Paul said it. We've quoted it. The things I would do, those I don't. The things I would not, those I do. It's not me, but the sin that dwelleth within me. How is it possible to be free from sin and yet still fight sin? You see, the truth is simply this. You may be done with sin, but sin isn't done with you. You may be done with your past, but your past isn't done with you. And it is our environment, our experiences, those cumulative issues in our lives that form us. And if you're not careful, even after the power of redemption you'll find yourself caged. And this is what causes some people to be frightened of Christianity. Because they hear about the deliverance of the cross and then they see our lives not match the sermons we speak. And they wrestle as we wrestle. How can can you be saved and then act the way you do? How can you be saved and, and, and then not forgive? after you've been forgiven so much. In fact, Jesus would ask that same question. Forgive with the same measure you've been forgiven. And for me, that means I have to forgive a lot. So I have to come out of the temptation to be bitter and angry, hateful and violent. Because to him who's been forgiven a lot, I have to forgive much. There's not a person in this house that doesn't understand on some intellectual level what it is your pastor is speaking of. You've been saved, but something still holds you. And it is my desire through the process of these last six weeks that a light comes on, that an understanding emerges, that you can come out of the cage that you don't have to live the way you've always assumed you had to live, but that God has a plan for complete and total deliverance for your life. That even though you're saved, we're still a work in progress. I don't know, would anybody agree with that? It, it, to say no would then to be duplicious. To say no, I'm finished, my work is done would be intellectual dishonesty, emotional falsehood, because there's not one of us who isn't on the path to full deliverance and freedom. So let's make it our agenda personally to come out of the cave, out of the cage, out of the prison, out of the jail, out of the darkness, out of the night, and into his marvelous light. Our testimonies free us. In fact, Revelation would say, speaking of how Christians overcame the adversary, they would say they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the words or the word of their testimony. So we have walked through some amazing testimonies in the last five weeks. And today we will do the same. It's my honor to invite to this platform as my special guest, Bailey Tisdale, 
Come on up, Bailey. Bailey is my niece, married to my nephew, Caleb. Bailey, we're glad you're here. Amen. Would you make Bailey welcome? You may be seated, Bailey. I'm also going to invite to this platform PD. PD, come on up here. My lovely assistant. Thanks, babe. Have a seat right there. So we're going to learn a little bit about Bailey's testimony, Bailey's life, and we're also going to learn a little bit about you and your life because I think today you're going to understand some parallels to help you be free. Are you ready? Right. Bailey, we're glad you're here. Glad to be here. Um, Bailey uh, is your, I'm, I know I'm not supposed to say age, but I'll say this, early 30s. How's that? Does that work? Is that a good answer? All right, that works. She's in her early 30s. She's married to my nephew, Caleb Tisdale, who is my brother's uh, boy. And then this is his girl now. They pastor in Parkersburg, West Virginia. So over the course of these last six weeks, we've had a different uh, menagerie of guests. We've had people here, people scheduled, schedules change, COVID conflicts. We've had all kind of craziness. And when we were preparing for this week, my wife and I were having a discussion on Mother's Day, who could speak to you? Who would be the right guest that could minister to the moms? And my wife and I begin to discuss Bailey. Bailey uh, is a college graduate. Uh, Bailey is married to a minister. Caleb is a minister. He's also the principal of a large Christian school. He is also the president of the, of the transportation board in Wood County, West Virginia. Uh, Bailey is also a realtor. She was just voted one of the top 30 realtors in the state of West Virginia. And so... Uh, very successful. They have three beautiful children that are their natural children. Uh, and then they have an adopted daughter. So that it is a family of four. When everybody looks from the outside, you're sort of the perfect family. You got all this stuff going on. You're blessed. Your husband and you are flipping houses. And just so many good things going on. But I want you to share with the congregation and those listening and watching. It wasn't always like that, was it? Uh, tell a little bit. Hold that mic up and tell us a little bit, Bailey. Um, my birth mother was 18 when she had me. Nobody knew she was pregnant. Uh, she lived in the middle of the country in a cow field. She had me on Labor Day weekend and gave birth to me by herself in her bedroom, cut her own umbilical cord, wrapped me up, went and took a shower. They were having like a family gathering that day for Labor Day, and some family members came in, found me, took me to the hospital, got me cleaned up. So, so just, just pause for a second, 18 having a baby, a baby having a baby. Let's just be honest, that's a baby having a baby. Has the baby alone, has the baby, it goes through labor alone, a, a secret, we've, we've discussed this quite a bit, cuts the umbilical cord, leaves the baby, uh, in the room and the baby is then discovered by relatives. So the very beginnings of your life is traumatic. Uh, go on, tell some more, Bailey. So uh, my birth mother's 18, she doesn't know what she's doing. Uh, there was a, like a step aunt and uncle, not even a blood related aunt and uncle, just kind of a distant relative. And they would help her and keep me during the week and she'd come get me on weekends and then she'd bring me back to them during the week. And this went on, you know, for the first six months or a year of my life until one day they just saw, you know, she was struggling and they said, can we keep her? And she said, yes. Um, so this, this, these people raised me, you know, they were no blood relation. They were an older couple in their uh, 50s and 70s. My dad was much older than my mom. I called him mom and dad. That's who raised me. That's all I ever knew. My mom was apostolic. She raised me in a Pentecostal church. I went to the same church my whole life from birth to the age of 24 when I moved away and got married. She brought me to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, every cleaning day, every work day, every family function. If there was a revival three hours away, we went. But my dad, he did not go to church. Um, he... I don't wanna say he was a bad person, but he wasn't a nice person. Um, he would keep the car for my mom so that we would have to catch rides to church, and we would. She never let it stop her. 
he was very verbally abusive to her. Um, you know, his, his language was just foul and a lot of cursing, and he just made life very difficult for her, as difficult as he could sometimes. Um, but she never left him. You know, she stayed true to her vows, and she just kept on keeping on. She kept bringing me to church. She kept doing the right thing. She instilled so much consistency and faithfulness in me. Um, I was telling him it kind of reminded me of the story of Moses. Um, you know, his mom only had him for a little bit when he was younger, and then he went to be with the Egyptians, but he came back to save his people. You know, he, he took what his mom instilled in him, and he carried that on through life. So my mom, she raised me in church. I uh, was in sixth grade one day, 11 years old, and she was always first in line to pick me up. And it was a Friday, and she didn't come pick me up that day. So I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. Nobody comes to get me. Um, they had an older daughter who lived nearby. You know, I called her my sister. And I said, nobody came to get me. You got to come pick me up. So she does. She drops me off at home. Car is there. I go inside, and I found my mom um, in her chair, 11 years old. She had had a massive heart attack when she was 53. I run out the house, go next door. There was a nurse that lived next door to us. And, you know, before I knew it, there was ambulances and there was firefighters and church people in the yard was full. And I don't remember a lot from when I was 11, but I remember that day very vividly. Um, and, you know, she was gone. My rock, the person who took care of me, the person who made my lunches and did everything for me, she was gone. And now I was 11 and I was alone with a 75-year-old man to take care of me. And, you know, he was just older. He didn't know what to do with a young girl. I had to give him his medicine. I had to clean. I had to just kind of figure out things on my own. You have a young lady that her birth mother was incapable of handling her life. A, a surrogate mom steps in, not a relative, a step aunt, takes care of her. They're older. Her family has grown. She has daughters. They're all grown. They have pulled someone in, and it's very similar to some of you who are raising grandchildren and great-grandchildren who are stepping in in other people's lives, and, and Bailey is then raised by this step-aunt, and at 11 years old, she passes. Two blows to a mother, to a young lady, by the time she's 11. And can I, can I just say it clearly? I'll repeat what I said when I began. She's married raising three beautiful children. Her husband sent me a text and he said this. He said, I have just some thoughts about Bailey. He said, and I laughed. He's the first thing he said is, we come from a very strong and opinionated family. Pretty sure he was talking about my brother. But uh, <laughs> then he says, very few ladies could have fit into our family the way Bailey has. He said, I had no reference to understand her pain because of the intact family I had. But she is so loving. So something is amazing to me here. Here's a young lady who loses a mom, two moms, and now she is being raised by a 75-year-old man and north of 75. And she's alone, so to speak. So Bailey, tell them a little bit about that time. You told me something. You said, I don't know if I should really tell it, but go ahead and tell it. So, you know, he, he was older. He didn't know what to do with a girl. Um, so when I got into eighth grade, I kind of started just hanging out with the wrong crowd and, you know, doing things that probably wouldn't be considered appropriate for a young Christian lady. And uh, he was older, so he would go to bed early. And I would take the car at night and just go riding around. I didn't really go anywhere. I just, Wait, eighth grade? Yes, eighth grade. I was 13. And after he would go to bed, I would just drive a car around all night, come back by 4 o'clock in the morning, and then go to school the next day. I was just acting out, you know? I just, just something to do. I don't know. Um, my ninth grade year, he got put into a nursing home. He was older and sick. Um, and so their daughter, my sister, you know, by adoption, I went to live with her. The end of my ninth grade year, my dad then passed away. And uh, that summer was really hard for me. I just went through this whole struggle, you know, like here I am, I'm an orphan. You know, my birth mother couldn't take care of me. My parents that did want me, they're, they're gone. 
I don't have anybody. I, um, I obsessed for a little bit about trying to find my birth father because I don't know who he is. And I would just look for him everywhere I go. And, um, you know, I finally just kind of let that go because I didn't think I would ever find him. And um, my grades had slipped my ninth grade year. So I'd lost my chance at valedictorian, which was hard for me. And it's just everything was just going wrong. And so the summer before I started 10th grade, I got a hold of a, a bottle of some prescription medication and I, I swallowed about half of it. And I immediately regretted that decision, number one, because I, I knew that that was the wrong thing to do, but because I knew that God could do something. He hadn't brought me this far and put me through everything for me to just throw it all away. So I I made myself, you know, get the pills back up and just kind of sat there for a couple hours crying and praying, God, please just let it be okay. You know, don't let me, don't let me die. Um, because even though I didn't choose abandonment, you know, it just kind of happened to me. What I could choose was healing and I could choose to move Beautiful. forward. Um, so I'm living with, you know, this sister and she's also suffering. You know, she lost her parents. Those were her blood parents. She had suffered a broken marriage and it had just become a toxic environment. You know, she was hurt. I was hurt. We were not a good fit together. I told my counselor at school what had happened about the pills, about just everything that was going wrong in life and that I felt like if I continued in this situation, I was gonna go down a bad path. And um, I talked to my pastor and his wife, who I'd known my whole life, you know, still going to church through all this. Never, there's never been a time in my life where I didn't go to church. Like there's never been a period where I just skipped out for a month. I've always went to church. So I told them what was going on and they, you know, even though their daughter was grown and married, they offered for me to come live with them to give me some structure and some religious stability and to get me back on track. So I did that. My sister was very hurt. We didn't speak for a couple of years, but it, it changed my life around. Um, you know, they made sure that I was going to church camps. It was the first time I had ever been around other Pentecostals my age. They took me to youth services and they just, they gave me, they gave me what I needed to hope. get back on track. They gave you hope. They yes. gave you love and hope. It, there's a couple of keys. I hope you're catching them. Some people are caught in cages of despair and fear. Others are caught in physical pain. Others are in cages of anger, violence, or substance abuse. Some are in cages, not of their making, but it's the rejection that the enemy heaps on us because we do feel the abandonment it might be a broken marriage. It might be the loss of a mom or a dad, the death of a sibling, and it cages us and imprisons us. But they're in an effective bondage, even as though we didn't choose it, it's just as effective. And you're, you're looking at a young lady who has owned the difficulty in her lives and refused to be a victim, but rather a victor. She found a way to push through. And I asked her, I, I asked hundreds of questions last night. I kept pressing her. I kept saying, Bailey, what is it? How'd you do it? How did you lose your relationship with your birth mother? How did you lose your mother and your father that loved you? How did you then lose your sister who was not a blood relative, but the only sister you could have, a stepsister? And then, then you're now you're in a pastor's home and they're older, their kids are raised. And, and she told me, she said, sometimes I felt like I was an imposition and I'm a teenager and they're older and I'm driving them crazy. But yet you heard the secret. Tell them what it was. How did you make it, Bailey? It was, it was consistency to church. Even when I didn't feel it, even when I didn't want to go, it was, it was all I knew. It was all I knew to get up and go every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, every work day, every prayer meeting, every out of town service or revival. I mean, every weekend it seemed like I was, we were driving two, three hours to go to some youth service or some revival. It was just constantly putting those, those words and those services in my heart. I, I'm telling someone in this room, you don't have to let your circumstances own you. You can own your life. 
You can take control of it. You can decide not to be bitter, but to be better. You can make a decision not to quit, to give up, or to blame someone else for the circumstances around your life. And you can rise and the favor of God be upon your life because you just keep doing the little things well. You do the process well. We, we heard it from Lisa Sims the first week when her husband was going through difficulty. She said, I just kept going to church. Don't give up on God. God has not given up on you. Bailey, tell us a little bit about the, the transition then with, with you, the adoptive parents, which were your, the pastor and his wife. Tell us a little bit about that time. Um. You know, so their, their daughter was grown. They're, here they are with a teenager. <laughs> we don't know what to do with each other. Um, but they just, they just would talk to me. They would sit me down and talk to me almost every other night. And this is what you have to do. You have to be saved. Heaven is the most important. In this house, we're going to serve the Lord. You know, in this house, we're going to live differently. In this house, we're going to look differently. And they just kept repeating that to me over and over again. And, you know, just to to strive for better, that even though I came from brokenness, that even though I had a bad past, I could change the future and I could move on and hope for better and do better. Did you hear her words? Even though she came from a difficult circumstance, I could change the future. Amen. There's not a person in this room, you can change your past, but you can shape your own future. Amen. You can make a decision to be all that God wants you to become right now. You can't do anything about the, 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 the mistakes, the issues, the failures, the lies, the abandonment, the rejection, the despair, the suicide attempts, but you can change your future if you make a decision. I think, I think what's so incredible in such a testimony as well we all have the decision, because life brings us situations that are out of our control. Bailey could be bitter. She has the perfect excuse. Yeah. And I say excuse because we can all find them. She has the perfect excuse to be bitter. But instead of being bitter, Bailey wanted to be better. Right. And I think it speaks volumes, even on Mother's Day, she mentioned earlier about her, her second mom. She brought her to church. It didn't matter. Church was not optional. And mothers, and this is even for fathers, this is for parents raising children. Church is not optional. If you want your kids to have a relationship with God, the only stable force in Bailey's life, obviously you're hearing the tumultuous beginning of Bailey, it, there was nothing constant in Bailey's life. There was nothing consistent. But right. the only consistent force that Bailey keeps referring to is, my mother took us to church. It didn't matter if we had to catch a ride. Her mother did not make excuses for the kids to get to church. I remember when we pastored our first church in Arcata, there was a mother that was very ill. She actually contracted the disease of AIDS and she was very sick and she discovered it being in the hospital. Long story short, her husband uh, had drug usage and different things, but long story short, even though they were on very limited budgets, raising kids, Rowanna made sure those kids were at church. Right. If they had to not go somewhere or she, I know she made the kids walk to school because they had to have enough gas to make it to right. church. Church was a priority. Right. Parents, mothers make church a priority because later in life you have Baileys that turn out and they're serving God because of the beginnings of the consistency of going to church. It's it's, it's not so just serving important. God, it's serving community and serving others. Bailey and Caleb brought, took into their life. They, they, Bailey can tell it, but right when she was having her first child, Kenna, tell them what happened, Bailey. Um, so I had my first blood relative in March of 2014, my oldest daughter, Kenna. So, so think about that. Let, don't, don't jump past that. Her first blood relative. So her mother gave her up and she had no connection to her mom and no connection to anyone naturally related to her because she was raised by people not related. So until she had Kenna, her own daughter, her own daughter 
That's the first time she felt complete with someone who was a blood relative. So finish that, Bailey. So I had, I had my first daughter, Kenna, in March of 2014. And then later that year, that fall, I got another daughter. Um, there was a girl in our school, her name was Kiki. She was going through a very similar situation. Um, you know, her, her mom was just kinda in and out of her life and she was starting to go down a wrong path. She went to our Christian school and she began just staying with us on the weekends and then it turned into a permanent thing. Uh, but it was such a God thing. I mean, I know it gave me a chance to give back what someone gave to me. And I know that we helped her, but she helped us too. She became a part of our family. My kids love her as their own sister. They don't know any different, that's, that's her, their sister. Um, and it was just such a beautiful thing to give somebody what someone gave me, a chance, a fighting chance, and a hope for a, a better tomorrow, that things can go right, that things can look better. You have no idea the power your love can make. Amen. No idea the difference the power your love can make. It, your investment in someone, and again, I reference some of you that are raising children that are not yours, that are, or, or maybe they're your grandchildren or great-grandchildren, and you're loving those families, and some of you have adopted others. Let me make it plain. You have no idea what your investment's going to do in their future and in their lifetime. We, we don't just serve God for ourselves. We serve God and serve others so that it just mo creates a ripple effect moving forward. It, it's one of my favorite stories in scripture. It's, it, it's in the middle of 70 years of exile for Israel. It's in their third deportation and it's a, it's a difficult time and the cost of this difficulty has been very high on the, on the children of Israel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are imprisoned and, and uh, so many different people. Jeremiah is imprisoned and Esther who would say, let my people go. She, she, is, she is imprisoned and you got all of these things going on and happening in this time of 70 years. But during that difficult time, one-fifth in the 70 years, one-fifth of the Old Testament is written in the most difficult of times. One-fifth. And Jeremiah, in the middle of it, we quoted a whole lot, and you love that scripture. It says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, to bless you, and to give you an expected end. It's written while they're in captivity, while Jerusalem has been destroyed. It's written when everything's upside down. And then in the middle of that, perhaps my favorite part, the word of the Lord comes and tells the prophet, buy the field of your cousin, Hanamel. And, and, and Jeremiah says, well, why should I buy the field of my cousin? That cousin is the one that turned me in to the Babylonian police, so to speak, and I'm in prison because of him. Why would I buy that field? Not to mention he's trying to get it from me for nothing. I'm not gonna buy that field. But the Lord speaks to him, buy the field of your cousin. And he says, he's arguing with the Lord. He's in prison while this is happening. Why, why should I buy that field? No, 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 I'm not gonna do it. The field is occupied by the Babylonian army. And the Lord speaks very clearly to Jeremiah. He said, you're not buying it for you. You're buying it because in the generations to come, there will be houses in this place. There will be vineyards planted again. You're buying it for the people that come after you. And it, let me make it plain to all of you listening. You don't serve God passionately just for you. You do it for your children and your children's children. And you do it for Bailey's. You do it because, you know, if there's not a church that she's attending, that a pastor's being faithful, if there aren't people like you creating a worship environment and she's falling in love with God somewhere in that process, Bailey doesn't make it. You have no idea what your worship did in someone else's life today. No idea what your faithfulness is doing for someone else's family in this church right now. We're in this thing together. Amen? Amen? Bailey, so you told me last night that you have a Bible in your lap. Whose Bible is that? So we, you know, we weren't rich. We didn't have a lot. Um, we didn't even own the home that we lived in. But the one thing I did have from when my mom passed away was her Bible. She was a very wise woman. She was one of the best saints, I thought, in our church. And she was always studying, reading, praying out loud, you know, reading to me. 
Tell us a little bit of something. She left you something. Um, you were reading it to me. So I was telling him last night when I was 19, I moved out, got my own apartment. When I was 21, I bought a house. And, you know, even though I was established in the church, you know, you still go through those difficult years, you know, at that time in life. I'm in college. I'm trying to find a husband. I'm trying to figure out who I am. <laughs> and so... Well, um, there on all that trying to find a husband stuff. Okay. <laughs> Just take your time. <laughs> um... So something I would always, you know, read, she wrote little notes in the back of her book. So one that she wrote that was my favorite was, I thank you for the trial I'm going through. I don't understand why, but I know you're too wise to make a mistake and too loving to be unkind. And isn't that the truth? Like, God, it's so much happened to me and it would have been so easy to just call my life a mistake. You know, 18, unwanted pregnancy, mistake. Parents died, cruelty you know, just constant unwanting rejection, abandonment, but God's too kind to be cruel. You know, Beautiful. things things happen for a reason, things happen for a purpose, and we just have to believe that we can keep moving forward and we can get our healing and we can help somebody else be better. Beautiful. You've heard pastor say it, God may have not sent it, but God will use it to make you better. Why don't we just pause for a moment and give God permission to use every situation in our life to make us better. Jesus, I pray over this whole congregation. All of the situations that, that frustrate us, that we don't understand, Lord, we give you permission to use them for the betterment of our lives. Lord, you may not have orchestrated them, you may not have ordered them, they're the choices and the mistakes of other people often. But Lord, we refuse to let our environment make us a victim we're going to be a victor we're going to survive in the name of Jesus I pray faith over someone's life right now I pray belief into someone's life that there can be a better day that you can turn the corner to a better life you do not have to be what someone else says you have to be Bailey when when you're when you're going through this, I, I, I'm amazed by this because quite honestly, and I, and I think you'll understand what I'm about to say, when, when you've suffered significant rejection and abandonment as a, as a young person, when, you, when you've had that and those wounds are deep in your life, there's a, there's a couple of things that happen. You either close yourself off completely to affirmation and love and interaction from people, at least in my experience, or if you don't close yourself off, you embrace every man, everyone that ever shows you love, everyone, and you become very vulnerable because of the circumstances you are. But Bailey, somehow you pushed past that even though you felt unloved, rejected. H how did you do that? How did you keep your your sanity mentally and your purity sexually. How did you figure all that out, Bailey? I just, I just kept going to church. Um, I just kept being faithful. I just kept going. I kept going to camp every summer, even when there was times in my life where I probably wasn't living right or I wasn't doing the things that I should have been doing. I just kept going. You just gotta keep, keep going. Keep putting yourself out there. Keep pushing, even when it's hard. Just keep going. It doesn't sound real hard, does it? Simple solution to a complex problem. You keep doing the small things well. So to every person in this house that you're vacillating, you're, you're uncertain, can, can I just challenge you as pastor? Keep doing the small things well. The small things matter. You cannot... You cannot forsake the process on the way to your purpose. You have to do the small things well. You don't stumble into greatness. You don't stumble into greatness. You don't. You don't stumble into opportunities. Anybody that tells you, well, it just landed in my lap, they're not telling you the truth. That's not how the way life works. It happens because you made a decision to overcome. You made a decision to be consistent. If you're waiting for the lottery truck to pull up in front of your house, that's, that's probably not gonna happen. If you're waiting for the Brinks truck to have a wreck on I-4, the most dangerous interstate in the United States, I just read that, by the way. 
It's all of you snowbirds, by the way. But I, I just read that. I-4, the most dangerous interstate, and you're waiting for a Brinks truck to wreck and jump out and collect all the bags of money. It's probably not gonna happen. You have to do some small things right. Bailey had many excuses. She could have quit church. She could have walked away from God. And I, and I can't get over this. I've asked her a dozen different ways and I get the same answer every time. I keep saying, Bailey, why didn't you quit church? I just kept going. Because early in her life, she, she was exposed to something spiritual that began to change her life. Gabe sitting on the front row. Gabe took piano lessons from Bailey, I think it was. Bailey, as a, I, I met Bailey before uh, my nephew was kind of halfway interested in her, I think. I think they were barely dating. And I met Bailey because Bailey drove to revival. I was speaking in Louisiana. Then I met her a second time because she was teaching piano lessons to Gabe at another church. She just simply served God. And now we see the fruits of a family that knows nothing but the power of God and redemption in their life. And Kiki, their adopted daughter, has had her life transformed because she just kept doing the small things well. Somebody ought to make a commitment today to do the process right, to move towards your purpose. I just wanna say one more thing. Um, so the, the sister that, you know, talking about doing the small things well and just keep going and it'll pay off. The sister that I mentioned earlier that, you know, had also lost her parents and suffered the marriage and she wasn't in church. Uh, in 2017, I live in West Virginia. I don't have any, you know, family there besides my husband's family. She decided she wanted to make a change. She saw my life and my blessings and the loving family that I had married into and she moved from Louisiana, only place she'd ever lived, to West Virginia. She is now one of our best saints. She cuts our lawn every week, the church grass. She cleans the church every week. She does anything that my pastor and his life, my in-laws ask her to. I mean, she is just there for everything, every service, every Wednesday night, wow. every work day. She's there helping any way she can and in any capacity. And we've you know, mended that bridge and that brokenness that was there. And then um, also in February of this year, so my birth mother never, never talked to her. I hadn't seen her since I was a child. I don't even know when the last time I saw her or talked to her was. She found me on Facebook, and uh, we've been messaging a little bit, you know, just back and forth and trying to get to know each other. And uh, for the first time in my 32 years of life, I told her happy birthday a couple weeks ago. <laughs> so, you know, if, if there is hurt there, you can work past it. Um, you know, great relationships come from working through great problems. Beautiful, beautiful, wow. beautiful. You can never, wow. You can never judge a book by its cover. I look at Bailey, and Bailey's been in the Tisdale family nine years, and I marvel. Pastor and I were going through Bailey's story last night because we didn't know all the details. We were finding out a lot of this last night. I knew a little bit of the highlights, but I, I marvel at the goodness of God. When God has his hand on somebody, even Pastor Russell mentioned this. He said, when I was a young boy, I just felt the drawing of the Holy Ghost, and I knew I had a call on my life. When God has his hand on you, it doesn't matter what circumstance you go through. God is with you. Bailey has been through the most tumultuous childhood of anything I've ever heard. I've heard other tumultuous, but this is, this is pretty hard to beat as far as difficult circumstances. But in spite of it, look what God has done. And look at the hand of God, when God has his hand on something, how God makes something so beautiful. It's, it's absolutely amazing. I just, I, I'm like astounded to see the hand so of God. So I'm gonna say it this way. You don't just go through something, grow through something. Yeah. Grow through it. Uh, hand me that iPad. I, I, I'm gonna read something. Her husband last night couldn't be with us this weekend and Caleb, my nephew, sent me something. And, and he said, uh, I'm just gonna send you some thoughts about Bailey. Uh, randomly, we were actually talking and I couldn't get through the text without a few tears. But he said, I think the most amazing miracle was about Bailey was after both adopted parents had passed, 
living from place to place and part of the time with an adopted sister who at that time was away from God and discouraged Bailey from serving God. Bailey was able to not give up. So I'm asking someone in here to keep fighting. Don't give up. Don't surrender your faith. He said, most of the people I know that had early childhood trauma, they either rush into marriage and dating, make grievous mistakes, or they withdraw. But God protected my wife and saved her. Others become so closed and walled off, they never really love again. But here's what he said, Bailey is not that way. She's the most loving person I know. People are drawn to her. Everyone loves her. So can I say it to every person in this house? Don't let your circumstances steal your love for other people. Don't let abandonment, rejection, despair, don't let the cage of injury or hurt or loneliness, don't let it steal your compassion and your love for other people because it's come for a circle now. She has a relationship with the adopted sister. She has a relationship with her mother. God has given her a healthy family. And if it can happen in Bailey's life, it can happen in this room. And to everyone listening, it can happen for all of you. Do you believe that? So let's come out of the cage. Don't use your past experiences as a reason to be bitter and angry and frustrated and wall off yourself from the love and the connection to community and other people. Open yourself up to the goodness of God. Open yourself up to someone else and let God's healing take place in your life. Would you stand to your feet with us all? Deborah, stand up. I want you to pray Deborah, over all the moms in this house specifically. I want you to pray over anyone who's caged or wounded, but I want you to pray over the mothers. It's Mother's Day. We brought Bailey in for one reason, because we watch Bailey love her children and lead them so faithfully. And I'm trying to impress on someone that no matter how effective the cage of your thoughts and your frustrations and your fear and your injuries may feel, you can get out. You can escape. You are not what happened to you. Oh, I felt the spirit of the Lord when I said that. Say this with me. Say, I am not what happened to me. I am not what people say I am. I am what God called me to be. PD, why don't you just say a few words and then pray over this house. Pray over the moms. Everybody bow your heads. Jesus, I ask you today, be with our moms. God, you know the beginnings of every mother in this place today. Some have more hurts than others. Some have been in more cages than others. But we all have situations that we have been through. God, I pray today, I pray healing today upon our moms. I pray, God, that you would encourage our moms today. Oh, God, I thank you for your spirit that's upon us, God. You said you came to heal the brokenhearted. You came to heal and set free those that are bruised. I pray today that your spirit would cover us today. I pray the healing balm of Gilead today. I pray for the strength upon our moms. Being a mom is not an easy task. I pray, God, that you would give our moms wisdom today. I pray that you would give them wisdom beyond their years. I pray today, God, that we would guide our children with your word, God, and with your spirit. We can't do this alone. We got to have your help today, God. Help us today to be everything you designed us to be. Help us to mold and to shape our children, God, and to the gifts that you've given to us, God. Help us to mold them to be everything you designed them to be, God. 
I pray, God, that you would give grace to our moms today as they raise their children in the ways of the Lord. You said raise them up and they shall not depart from it. I pray for all of our kids today that have been taught the ways of the Lord. God, bring them home for those that have strayed today. I pray, God, that you would move upon the kids that are here today. Oh, God, I pray, help us today. Help us to be the moms you intend us to be, to make our children everything you desire them to be. I pray, God, a special blessing today. I pray it upon every and each mom today. In Jesus' name, amen. Such a sweet presence of God is here. If today you're wrestling with a cage and that cage is rejection or abandonment loneliness something with some circumstances perhaps out of your control and you would like to walk to this altar for prayer I would be honored to pray with you today for you to step out of the cage if you hear and you say pastor I just been wrestling some confidence and my, my mind my self-esteem has been injured and I, I just don't feel like I can be what God's called me to be because of the injuries in my life. I believe God will heal your spirit today. But if, if, if there's just something in you and you say, Pastor, I really just need some prayer. I really just need prayer. I want you to, I want you to come right now all over this house if you feel led. The spirit's not done moving. I know that's true. You're here. Don't be ashamed. Don't be frightened. We're going to make some decisions right now that God would work in our lives. Thank you for coming all over this room. Lord, I'm praying for every person, every man and every woman that's approached this altar and each person in this house their injury, to their spirit, to their emotions. You said, God, that you came to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty the captive, to restore sight to the blind, and to set at liberty the bruised. I'm asking you, God, heal every bruise on every spirit and set at liberty every captive. Set free every spirit today. I pray against the emotional trauma that has impacted people's lives. I pray against the pain. Lord, we're saved, but we're caged. Let our spirits soar. Let our minds be free. In the name of Jesus, I pray today, let someone make a decision to do the small things well, to make some decisions that would free Free them from the prison of their past. Come on, pray it right now. God, I, I'll no longer be angry. I, I won't blame the situation anymore. But God, I'm going to do my best to become everything you've called me to be. I, I'm not going to use it as an excuse. I refuse to be a victim. I'm going to rise above the pain and the disappointment for you to bless and use my life. To be all I can be for you, God. To push past the disappointment, the rejection, the despair, the abandonment, the fear. I pray let healing flow across this house from every side, from the back to the front. Let the Spirit of God begin to flow over this congregation right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, I pray that someone would come out of the cage, come out of the fear, come out of the pain, come out of the anxiety. In the name of Jesus, I pray for a healing mentally and spiritually in this house right now. I command you to be released from your pain and your your fear I speak healing over your mind be released by the power of the Holy Spirit you are not alone you're not alone in the name of Jesus I call healing over every believer in this house why don't you raise your hands and let the Spirit of God flow over you hallelujah God heal the wounds right now heal the pain right now God step close Come close to us. Draw close to us, God.